Hi and welcome to Just Rolling On. Today's review is really focused on the camping equipment we used for our six month adventure across Australia and South America on our KTM 690 Enduro. Um, so really the review is to focus on the utilization of the, of the camping equipment during an adventure motorcycle trip, which for the most part was in pretty, some pretty rough and extreme off-road terrain. Um, it's not focused on utilizing the kit in a climbing environment, for instance, or um, multi-day trekking. It really is how to use this type of kit and the sort of kit you need uh, to help you survive during a, a long extended uh, motorcycle expedition, and more importantly for me, doing it solo. So what were my key objectives for choosing the kit I did and how did it work during the trip? Well, really three main objectives are applied to everything for the trip. First, it had to be light, as light as possible. Given the type of terrain I was uh, intending to traveling across um, and the type of riding I wanted to do, which was really hard enduro stuff, it really had to be as light as possible to facilitate using the bike in, in that type of extreme terrain. Two, it knew you needed to pack as small as possible. I was intending to carry as little as possible during the trip. So really most of the gear had to fit inside either my panniers or in a roll top at the back of the bike. And three, it really had to be as robust as possible and reliable as possible. Um, in some of the places we're traveling through, less so Australia, but more so some of the more extreme places in South America, there's little opportunity to replace stuff and little opportunity to repair it. So it really had to last the trip. So with these, those three objectives in mind, I went off and did what most of you probably do and did a lot of research online, um, took in a lot of reviews like this one and took a lot of people's opinion. Um, and that worked to an extent, but secondly, and probably more importantly for me, um, I took in the um, expert advice of uh, people I knew or got to know and trusted. Um, for me, living up here in Edinburgh, I decided to link up with uh, Tiso in Edinburgh and the shop manager at the time, uh, Robbie. Um, and I spent a lot of time heading in and out of Edinburgh, discussing things with them, looking at stuff and looking at how stuff would work on an expedition like this. Um, and work for me in particular and the type of um, stuff I wanted to do during the six months. Um, and over the course of the couple of three months we took to plan the trip, we come up with a good plan for the type of gear and Tiso helped uh, uh, sourcing the gear for the trip. So what, 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 uh, what else did we do? Well, uh, having procured the kit, um, we obviously had to test it. Um, so I headed off uh, to do some wild camping on the west coast of Scotland uh, with another bike and uh, learned how to pitch a tent in good and bad weather and to break the, tent, the camp down. Um, wasn't very good at it but certainly by the end of the six months got a lot better at it. Um, and I suppose that the other thing that, that was really key to me as well that I should have mentioned is uh, um, I was really keen given that given the, the extremity of the trip and, and uh, how difficult it was likely to, to be. I really didn't want to compromise on quality. So if things had to, to meet my three criteria, um, I had no intention of compromising on quality. And to that extent, I'm glad um, I took on the advice of uh, Robbie at uh, TSA. So what were the main elements? Well, you know, we'll uh, kick to the chase straight away. Obviously the tent is, is by far the biggest element. Um, my intention was to do as much wild camping as possible. And to that extent, was really pretty successful in certainly in Australia. Australia is, is a, a camper's dream for, for camping in the bush. Um, it really is just, just amazing. In South America, I found less opportunities, surprisingly, for, for wild camping, but when they did crop up, um, I was really glad that the gear I had worked really well indeed. So let's cut to the chase in terms of the tent. Um, there's a separate video um, of the tent. Um, all uh, erected in, in my back garden and there's various pictures uh, online on the website just rolling on and, and indeed on Tiso's website. But the tent I chose for the trip, um, I decided to go with the uh, Heiliberg Nano 2 GT. Number of reasons, um, A, it hit all my three objectives being relatively light. This thing uh, weighs in at roughly two and a half kilos, maybe slightly more than that, but two and a half kilos isn't too bad. That's with uh, the titanium um, tent pegs and uh, titanium uh, tent poles as well. 
Um, it had a pack small. Well, as you can see, that went inside my uh, roll top on the back of the bike with my, the rest of my camping gear as well. Pack's really small and had to be ro robust and reliable. Well, I didn't have any problems at all. Had no tears, rips, failures, um, no zips breaking or anything. And I probably used it um, over the course of the six months for at least 50 to 60% of the time I was away. So roughly um, 120 days camping out of the 200 days we were on the road. So high, highly robust and used in all environments. Um, down in Patagonia, winds over 40, 45 mile an hour on the side of the hills top at uh, four and a half thousand meters. Um, stayed in place, didn't get much sleep but the thing stayed in place. Um, in the Australian outback in, in temperatures approaching 40 degrees um, uh, during the day and then down to uh, close to zero at night um, survived that also. So it really does survive the extremities and, and, and is designed for that. Why did I choose a two-man tent as opposed to going even smaller? Well, I, I needed space. Um, I, I like my comfort. Um, and given the length of time I was going to be away and the fact I wanted to put most of my motorcycle and gear um, securely in the tent or maybe even, and, and I did, cook in the tent in the vestibule um, I needed a little bit more room than, than a simple one mine tent would provide so I went for the Nala too and, and given the fact it packs into this sort of space really a two-man tent um, had no compromise for me at all uh, really an excellent choice so it met my criteria in terms of being spacious but lightweight and being really robust. Um, worked in all climates, um, got down to below, well below freezing, up to, as I said, around about 40 degrees with no serious issues. Um, I think uh, the only thing that I did during the trip um, that I hadn't thought of prior to that, I did actually end up buying a tarp in Australia. Um, given some of the terrain we were camping on, we didn't want the, the, the risk of puncturing the um, the undershoot and the fly shoot in, in the tent, so I decided to take a uh, just fit it underneath the, the most vulnerable part of the tent, and frankly, uh, for the sake of carrying that thing, yeah, that helped a lot. And also, when packing and unpacking, it's good to have something uh, to to light, lay it down on, and not on in some of the sandy, rough, or even muddy ground um, that, that that you could have in, in terms of packing. So. I just in, in the end carried it up one and a half by two meters, I think, and that, that worked out really well. Um, so what else? Uh, I think that the only other thing I would comment upon with this, um, the titanium temp pegs of this are great for relatively secure ground. Um, a lot of the places in, um, or some of the places in South America and some of the places in Australia, it would have been nice to have the option to camp in some of the beaches, for instance, and some of the more sandy places. Really, you need sand pegs for that. Um, given the fact it's it's not it's an unsupported tent, you really need longer pens or a better security mechanism. So, so that was one thing I suppose I did compromise on. Didn't think about it before the trip. Maybe worth some something to consider if you're going into any sandy areas. But this uh, Heilenberg Nano 2 GT tent is being super thoroughly recommended. Um, the next probably most important thing: the sleeping bag itself. Again, trying to meet the criteria, keep it light, keep it small and robust and reliable. Um, Robbie and I at, at TSO had a long discussion about the sorts of extremities of temperature and how, how to cope in both high temperature and really low temperature. Um, and given the, the, the sort of weight we wanted to go with, um, what we ended up um, deciding upon was a Tundra Pure 5 tent um, with a Rab silk liner. So I'm not going to take it all the way out, but uh, this is the Tundra Pure 5. Not overly expensive, a couple of 220 quad quid, I think. Downfill tent. Um, really importantly for me, um, it meets all the criteria of being able to to be warm, cosy. Um, down to I think the comfort level on this is is minus five degrees C. Um, and really, if it gets any colder than that, I was carrying a ton of um, uh, technical gear that I could layer up anyway and, and, and sleep inside to, to get added comfort and probably only need to rely on that a couple of three times, I guess, 
um, but most of the time I simply slept in this in, in my underwear and it was uh, perfect um, really. This thing weighs in at only 880 grams would you believe which is amazing and packs using a low compression bag into a space which is roughly akin to that. Um, roughly I would say 10 inches by 8 inches in diameter really small compression uh, sack which would work really well in carrying on the on the back of the bike um, so as I said this is downfield minus 5 degree, degrees C comfort range under 800 grams in terms of weight and pack, packs in really low um, and again I had no feelings in it at all it was brilliant uh, worked as I said used this up at 5,000 meters just below 5,000 meters uh, at below um, freezing um, and also in the middle of the Atacama Desert where during the day it, it's, it's well into the 30s and at night right down to zero worked really well and as I say packs in really nice and small so that as I say is the Tundra Pier 5 um, and inside of that uh, obviously a silk liner which is really important the one thing that you can wash on the road uh, sleeping bag being something that's really difficult to wash um, so definitely recommend carrying a silk liner it just makes it so much easier and so much comfortable inside especially if you're wearing gear inside the sleeping bag work really well um, sleeping mat given again some of the terrain we're on um, very few grass patches to lie on a lot of it was rocky and certainly in the bush the, the stuff all over the deck to be honest yes we've got a tarpaulin but it's nice to have something um, a little bit softer line give you a nice quiet sleep um, and also uh, gives you some warmth as well when the temperature gets down uh, so again applying the same criteria needed to be light Robbie really needed to be light uh, and needed to pack small so we had the same discussion um, and we ended up with a um, Thermarest Pro Light 5 self inflating sort of not really you still needed a blow in it but you've got the principle of being self-inflating. But again, you see the size of that. That's, that's how it packs down into. This is a full-length sleeping mat. Full-length for a 5 foot 8 person. Easily loads of room. Um, the valve never failed. Never got any punches. Um, uh, and it inflates to, I think, roughly about 4 millimeters. It's not, not super thick but you don't feel anything underneath it um, inflates relatively quickly packs relatively small you have to blow in it a bit it takes about a minute or so to blow up but only 480 grams really really important um, when we come to the end of this we'll summarize all this up and give you some idea of the total weight of everything but really light that's the Thermarest Pro Light 5 thing self-inflating 480 grams Packs really small uh, and totally robust, excellent. The other important thing for a good night's sleep, and I found this out to my cost, didn't test it enough, um, is a good pillow. I tried on my small expedition the west coast of, of um, Scotland to use the usual stuff sack type pillows. Didn't, didn't just didn't work, just too small and, and actually too bulky. So I ended up buying um, a Van Gogh self-inflating pillow. Again, you can see the size of the thing there. Slightly smaller than the sleeping mat itself. And this is genuinely self-inflating. No need to blow any of this up and you can adjust it to your heart's content. If you like a big pillow or a small pillow, you know, give it a couple of minutes and the thing pops out and provides a good size pillow. Uh, and that actually fits quite nicely into the the um, the head space in in the sleeping bag, um, that worked brilliantly. To be honest, much better than a, than a stuff sack pillow and much bigger. And again, packs really small. The only one thing I say about this, and I learned again to my cost, it really needs a pillow sack um, or pillow case, I should say. Um, and it took me until I was halfway through the trip. I eventually found one um, from. Um, Thermarest, would you believe, that fits it perfectly. So I ended up with this beautiful Terry Telling uh, pillowcase uh, to use for the rest of the trip. Uh, worked brilliantly and that was like being home away from home. Highly recommended.
So that's the Van Gogh self-inflating self -inflating pillow. Um, getting on to the technical stuff now. Um, cooking on the road. Well, I must have, I didn't use it a lot. I suppose I expected to use it more. But again, needed a stove for cooking on occasion. Um, and again, using the same three principles, Robbie, it needed to be light and needed to be um, robust and I needed to pack really small. So what did we end up with? Well, we decided um, to get the Optimus Omnifuel um, for a few reasons. Excuse my bashed up um, MSR titanium um, pan set, but you'll see by this, it's in terms of packing capability, I get my stove into my MSR pots, um, two pots in here, so all, again, self-contained, and it would ensure that it would minimise the amount of space that was taken up in my panniers. That, again, hugely important to me, hugely important. Yeah, they're bashed up, but they still work. So what we got here, go on the pots in a moment. Um, my Optimus um, Omni Fuel Stove. Uh, why did I go for Omni Fuel? Well, I really thought naively at the beginning of the trip that um, getting hold of gas canisters was, gonna, was likely to be problematic. And I needed something where I could use uh, petrol, kerosene or whatever else during the trip. Um, and the reality of the situation is, certainly for South America and obviously definitely for Australia, camping Nirvana, um, I never needed to use petrol, kerosene or anything other than gas canisters. So carrying this thing around went unused for six months actually. I suppose there are places where it is needed, but um, that's probably a good lesson learned for everybody going to South America. You can get gas canisters anywhere. You really can, you just need to look around a bit. But this thing, um, Optimus Polaris um, Omnifuel thing was, once I got to understand how best worked and how best light it, it worked brilliantly. I mean, really brilliantly. It would, you know, burn the backside of anything in seconds. Um, uh, I tended to use um, uh, long uh, safety matches to light it rather than a, a, a gas fire lighter or anything like that. Um, but uh, that worked really well. Um, and you can see how small the thing is as well and uh, burns really nicely. Um, the thing I will say, like most of these stoves, uh, for you guys that are far more experienced camping out there than I am, and for the guys out there who are less experienced like us motorcycle adventurers, um, you know, cooking on this thing is, is an acquired art. Um, it will, as I said, it burns the backside at anything. So if you intend to cook a curry on here, you just better watch that it doesn't stick itself to the bottom of the pan as soon as you switch the thing on. Um, it's generally designed for boiling water quickly. Um, and probably the best things to use in that respect is to use the ball and bags. So um, you can buy uh, ball and bag food. You simply keep in the bag, put water into your pots and boil the water to heat the food. That's by far the best way of using things like this for my purposes. So I didn't use it a lot, but when I did use, need to use it, brilliant. As I say, never needed that. Um, may as well cover the, the pa pans when we're on the subject again. Robbie, lightweight, robust. Um, yep, they're all bashed around as they do, as they get packed into the panniers and the bike falls on, on them and so on and so forth. But the good thing is, protected that, and they're still functional. Doesn't matter whether they're square, rectangle, or other, where, whatever, they still worked brilliantly. And the thing you must not forget to take with you, doesn't matter whether you're inside the tent or outside the tent, guys, um, take your uh, aluminium foil shields for protecting the bottom of your tent if you're cooking inside it and indeed the wind deflector as well because the, the slightest breeze will blow your flame out really important as well and your tool kit so that's um, my optimus omnifuel um, talked about the pan set and indeed the other most important thing is your titanium mug um, or a stubby holder for carrying your beer so if you're a beer drinker you need a stubby holder or a mug for your wine. So that's what mine was. Um, other bits and pieces that uh, we need to, to take. This was my essentials um, stuff sack. I carried all my other camping gear. 
These things generally, stuff sacks were brilliant. I use stuff sacks for everything. Uh, couple of couple of three reasons. Um, color coded them so I knew what type of gear was in each of the stuff sacks in my panniers and the bag. But also it just keeps stuff together, it makes it far easier for packing and unpacking. So clothes had one color, riding gear had another color, camping gear had another, and they just work brilliantly. You know, you get them anything from about a liter up to 60 liters. So infinitely variable, brilliant, brilliant idea. Head torch. I decided to go with the um, Petzl RXP reactive headlamp. Um, lots of reasons, yep, it's expensive but didn't want to compromise in quality. It is a really important piece of kit. Not just uh, find your way around camp at night time, but you know, God forbid, needing to do some work on a bike uh, when it's dark or in twilight, I really need a good head torch. Uh, and this is, is just superb, really. Reactive meaning um, it, it um, can adjust the intensity and the direction of the light, depending upon whether you're close, in close range work or long range work. Um, and it's manually adjustable too. And, and probably most importantly, actually for me, it's USB rechargeable. So no stupid batteries to worry about. I can plug this into my USB charger on the bike um, and it'll give me hours um, of, of light. Worked really well. So that's the Petzl RXP reactive head, headlamp, USB retar rechargeable. Other bits and pieces we kept in here, really useful. Uh, these things are quite handy. Um, get these in home base or, or, or whatever um good little lights led lights carry a couple of small um small batteries inside and they have got a oh, there you go small hook in the back i used to use these inside of the tent at night time so save save a bit of battery power my head torch hang a couple of these inside the tent and the batteries would last forever they work really well um matches um Couple of things, one, uh, safety matches uh, for lighting fires. Love my bush fires in Australia. So safety matches for that and indeed the, the stove. These things picked up in Australia, which were brilliant. Campfire lighters, which are essentially a small bock block of a fire lighter with a match on the end, uh, totally waterproof. Just one of these like, would light a campfire instantly. Absolutely brilliant pieces of kit, used them a lot in specifically in Australia. What else did we carry? Uh, water carrying, I decided to take uh, two two litre platypus collapsible water carriers, never used them at all, ever. Um, carried a, some spare dry bags, stuff sacks, just in case. Uh, as I said, the, these things infinitely usable, brilliant pieces of kit. Uh, what else do we carry? Usual spoon, nice lightweight, Robbie, lightweight spoon. Um, and my fork set. Um, and things that can be useful for a motorcycle adventure ride on the road. Um, an MSL washing line. So I'd actually hang my wet gear up at the end of the, end of the day um, or wash it in the stream or whatever and hang it up and have some nice clean gear by the end of the day. A washing line, really important piece of kit. Um, so that's most of the gear, all the bits and pieces worth thinking about, um, towels, you know, that did me, it's a nice uh, terry tail type, lightweight, small tail, okay, doesn't hide all of you on, on the beach, but certainly for camping and carrying on a, on a road on a motorcycle, that worked really well. First aid kit, um, again, but my first aid kit and my personal um, toiletries kit, I carried in, in essentially two of these. Uh, and this one carried specific first aid stuff and all my medications and malaria tablets and, and so on and so forth. So getting onto the subject of, of, of other bits and pieces that are important to your personal health or, or on the road. Um, Australia being one challenge, South America being quite another. Um, Water pu purification, I thought long and hard about before I went away um, and carried all sorts of stuff to purify water with. And the fact of the matter is I never used, well, very rarely used any of it. Um, bottled water was freely available in most places. Um, and, you know, if you think about it, uh, when you're having to get to gas stations anyway, you top up with petrol. Most gas stations have water. 
So very rarely would you have to worry about running out of water. You know, you need to carry, certainly in crossing something like the Simpson Desert, you need to carry three, four, five, six litres, but that's perfectly, you know, you're perfectly able to carry that. Um, so what did I carry in terms of water purification just in case uh, it was needed? Well, I carried a Soya inline water purification kit, which is essentially um, a small filtration system, which I could plug into my hydration pack, which is a Krieger hydration pack. Um, to use for inline water filtration. So I didn't need to pre-filter the water, I would top up from wherever and use the inline filter to, to filter the water. Never used it. Or uh, water filtration tablets, which I did on occasion use just as a, as a double security measure. Um, first aid kit itself, <clears throat> probably the most important thing, I guess, <laughs> in Australia and South America was insect repellent. Um, and smudge insect repellent that's used for midges on the west coast of Scotland just is not strong enough, guys. Sorry, it just doesn't work. Um, I did carry this Avon Skin So Soft Extreme Expedition uh, Bug Guard Plus SPF 30 as well. Um, didn't work, I'm afraid, so full bottle came back with me. I did pick up in Australia something far more extreme um, from a local pharmacist. Uh, I can't remember what it's called now, but there are st there is stuff out there. Um, my advice is you get the best stuff you possibly can and do some research on it because there's nothing worse than an attack of the bugs, which I had in both Australia and in South America. Um, so getting on to that, you will get attacked and you will be bitten and you'll need protection against it. So that's probably the other thing that I didn't um, really prepare that well for and, and ended up getting some stuff again in Australia. I would seriously recommend carrying a hydrocortisol cream or antihistamine cream, cream and antihistamine tablets as well to reduce inflammation after bites because you, as I said, you will be bitten. Um, malaria, obviously, tons of malaria tablets. Um, try to get a hold of some good antibiotics, both for infection um, of your gut and infection in terms of wounds. Um, if the doctors won't prescribe you and you can't get them online, it's not that difficult. Good antibiotics. Usual stuff, Imodium, which sort of works and ish, not particularly strong for some of the worst bugs. And the usual stuff, ibuprofen, paracetamol, um, sunscreens, water purification, as I said. Um, and the other, um, which I don't think I've got here with me, um, other important stuff to me, um, electrolyte tablets. Uh, whenever you drink a lot, you need to replace the electrolytes in your, in your body. Probably more important than, than eating, especially in, in extreme conditions in deserts, like Cameron, and Simpson and the likes. Carry electrolyte tablets. I used uh, high five electrolyte tablets everywhere I went uh, and it certainly helped me. Um, so that's in terms of the, the medication stuff, other bits and pieces, wet wipes, get wet wipes. Wet wipes will save your life, be it cleaning an infected wound or cleaning up after you've been to the toilet. Wet wipes are brilliant. Um, so that sort of sums up um, most of the camping equipment um, and uh, its its use in terms of uh, how it uh, helped me in my six month journey across uh, Australia. And South America. Um, in terms of resources worth uh, looking at online, as I said, this, this is just a, really a summary of the equipment from my personal perspective and from the type of expedition that, that I was on. We'll be writing this up online and uh, a lot of the detail of this will be available on my website www.justrollingon.com. Resources worth looking into, certainly Tiso, um, and from my perspective Tiso and Edinburgh the guys were brilliant. Contact Robbie, the store manager, and Tiso, um, a wealth of knowledge and experience um, and highly recommended. Um, online resource, as a, uh, I would also recommend, is www.ultralightoutdoorgear. Tons of stuff on there that you can investigate and then go to Tiso and buy them. Um, and lastly, uh, in terms of the medication side of things as well, a, a good resource that I used, uh, Boots Travel Service, um, specifically for me, Boots Travel Service in Edinburgh, you go along there, pay a small fee uh, for them to do a risk assessment of your trip coming up and they will give you a lot of really good advice 
on types of medications that you can obtain over the counter or by prescription and the sort of things you should be protecting yourself against. Really excellent service out there. So that's a boots travel service. So that summarizes uh, the camping equipment side of the expedition. Um, other videos will be coming up uh, shortly in terms of the uh, tools and equipment for the expedition and luggage and clothing and equipment. But for now, thank you.